Welcome to Screen Quest, a podcast where a fellowship of film lovers and armchair movie experts plays film roulette. I am one of your hosts, Chris Waterman, joined by Will Rotondi. Hey, how's it going? And May Finch. Welcome back. Hey, hey. On this week's episode, it is part two of our There Will Be Blood versus No Country for Old Men versus Mode. Uh, for the purposes of time, we will be jumping straight into our discussion of No Country for Old Men, and then we will have our final debate and crown one of them the superior film. What do we decide that we're going to call it? A uh, Sethi? Is that is that what we're going to call it? A, a, a Grandpa Sethi? Yes. <laughs> okay. The first ever Sethi Award. We'll, we'll, we'll decide who that is going to go to uh, and maybe even make a little trophy that I can stick in the edit if someone's feeling bold um, on the in the art department, which is going to be uh, my lovely co-host <laughs> below me over here. So awesome. All right. No side quest today. No opener. Uh, we might have a little game at the end, depending on time, but uh, we'll, we'll see how um, how the discussion goes. So without further ado, let's jump into No Country for Old Men. Uh, we'll start with initial impressions. Uh, May, I'd like to go to you first on this because this is your first viewing of No Country for Old Men. I think I said, so we, we uh, watched this all together on like a Discord watch party. And I think within two seconds of the ending, I was like, well, that wasn't what I was expecting. <laughs> um. So yeah, I know that's a common response to, to the film where it ends. Um, I loved it. I loved a lot of things about it. I wasn't expecting that kind of pacing shift that you get about, you know, half an hour from the ending of the film. I'll share like more thoughts on that later. Uh, but yeah, I was definitely surprised. It wasn't quite what I was expecting based off all of the ways it's kind of leaked into pop culture, right? Um, but I was just floored, I think, by the character design over, over anything else. Just like the very interesting people in this story. And uh, uh, Javier Bardem just, just nailed his role. Like, I, I was scared. <laughs> yes. Yes, he is very scary. Very scary indeed. Well, awesome. Um, I can't wait to like, get, get more into it. But uh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's quite the ride um the first time so uh you know I was glad we got to kind of experience that that with you in real time um in our little watch party uh will how about how about you this is not your first time seeing it when was the last time you saw this just out of curiosity uh probably college i feel like that's a consistent uh, so, theme with most of the answers that i give is like yeah, yeah so okay. i watched this 10 years ago yeah <laughs> nice uh, so yeah. what did you make of it now on on your you know second ish pass uh, I think the stuff that always stands out to me is the dark humor. Like I always love the dialogue between a lot of the characters and just sort of the, it's very much like a Coen brothers film and that you feel like you're immersed in, in whatever, um, like, you know, for the, whatever culture they're trying to emulate. So, you know, like you think about the, the, the accents that were in Fargo and when everybody would talk about, Oh, you have to go see it just to listen to people talk. I feel like it's very much the same sort of mo in this one where you listen to all these texas i mean i don't i can't speak to the authenticity of it so that's up for debate but i feel like i, I just like listening to how the characters talk to each other but i also appreciate the dark humor and sort of the interplay the banter back and forth and um i also like how the coen brothers at least in this it felt in some ways when they're building that suspense uh that I feel like I'm watching in some ways like aspects of a Hitchcock film. There's a couple different scenes that I, especially like rear window uh, where the assassin played by Javier Bardem is about to just like come in on the protagonist. And it felt very much like Jimmy Stewart in rear window at the very end of the film. So, uh, but those are probably my two big takeaways. Yeah. Awesome. Um, observations like the Coen brothers, like, do an excellent job of immersing you Where, wherever you are, whether it be like a time period or place. Barton Fink, the same thing, you know, with kind of old Hollywood. Um, if you have never seen that, that's a wonderful movie with Johnson Turturro about a playwright who uh, is sullying himself by going to write uh, movie scripts in Hollywood. Uh, I think it's the 1940s or 50s, but um, I have to fact check that. It's been a little while. Um, but yes, yeah, similarly here. And I think one of the things I love about this movie is it bears 
both the stamp of the Coen brothers, but also the Cormac McCarthy like source material very well. I think it maintains both of those identities uh, very strongly. And uh, the actors do really, really great things with that, like, you know, uh, Cormac McCarthy speak. Um, you know, it's just like everybody just does an excellent job handling dialogue that I think could have felt a little bit clunky off the page if not handled just so. Uh, in particular, the more I watch this movie, because this is another annual rewatch for me, um, the uh, Tommy Lee Jones uh, sheriff character, um, I think might be my favorite character. I mean, Javier Bardem is wonderful, but I think like in terms of just um, the through line that we you get with him and some of his like sardonic humor and um, just, I don't, I don't know, it's a little quips and jokes, like, you know, any more bodies accumulate out there, then I believe I'll skip it, you know, <laughs> it, it just, he's so wonderful. Um, and his opening, um, you know, monologue and uh, kind of speech about his dream that bookend the film, I think really perfectly sets up and, and kind of polishes off like this eerie feeling that, uh, you know, like um, that the, the film has you know this this kind of feeling of persistent danger and and suspense and uh yeah i just i love him um dearly uh more and more every time i see it so but yes this is one of my favorites uh similarly to there will be blood the first time i saw this i knew it was seeing something very special that was going to be a favorite for for all time um so uh easy for me to gush about this but uh let, let's um let's jump into some some more detailed discussion um similar to last week we talked a little bit about uh the title um so let's start there first so what did you make of the title no country for old man what do you think it means um how do you think it's sort of like that the title plays into to what happens in the in the film so uh may i'll start with you again what are your thoughts on the title yeah it's it's interesting because um i was doing a bit of reading because i i haven't read the book the source material the cormac mccarthy book um but I was trying to look into a bit of like kind of like where the film did differ from the book. And it seems it's mostly in that framing, like the sheriff has more of a presence in the book than the film. Um, and like, I feel like that was the one thing I kind of didn't like that they changed because I was surprised when towards the end of the film, it was pretty much just the sheriff. And it, I realized that, oh, he's supposed to be kind of like the main point of view here. Um, I know that's intentional. But it, it really seems like the title um, is, I mean, it, it just kind of seems to sum up his point of view, which is that the world has, has changed and become kind of unrecognizable for him, an, an old man. <laughs> and um, I actually looked into the origin of the title a little bit. It's actually from a Yates poem, uh, mm -hmm. communicating a, a similar idea um, of things kind of becoming uh, the world of the young and indistinguishable uh, to the previous generation. But there is kind of a conflict within the film about that as well. If you like listen to what Ellis says about how, you know, th these horrible acts of violence aren't really new to the area, right? Um, something they've always been dealing with. So I like that even though it's the title, it's still an idea that gets some pushback in the film. Yes, uh, quite literally from an old man, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, like uh, that, that whole interaction is, is fantastic. Yeah, I think that's a great read, a great interpretation um, on it for sure. Well, what Yates poem? Do you remember? Was it The Second Coming? That's the only one I really know by him super well, but it's been a, it's, I'm it's, shaking. Uh, it's something Byzantium. Come back I'll, to me, I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah, Will. So uh, how about you? What, what did you make of the title? Do you have a, a different read on it? I think most of my read was kind of along the same lines. It's like that disillusionment of when you become old, what you expected your life was going to become by the end of it and what it turns out to be. But I think in some respects too, the pushback is that that's also sort of, I guess that it may or may not be within your control based on the, the circumstances that you're presented with. Like, I guess there's sort of the question of like, what's your fate going to be based on the choices that you make that we see mm -hmm. with the assassin with uh, Anton Chigurh, who comes after pretty much everybody in this film <laughs> at some point or another. And so it's a question of, uh, you know, do you recognize the choices that you make leading up to where it puts you? Do you feel like you had any control over that or not? 
And so I feel like there's a lot of there's a lot of questioning about just what exactly in your life you have control over. But it all sort of kicks off by this decision that Josh Brolin's character makes about, well, in the moment, wanting to take money, but then also having a change of heart at the last minute and thinking, I'm going to go help this guy who I think is probably dead, but he was asking for water out of this shootout where I took the money from. So I'm going to go back there and help him in the middle of the night because <laughs> I feel like I should. So I don't know, they're like questionable decisions by some of these characters where you're just thinking, yeah, I, I can follow you, but I also he verbalizes like, it that it's stupid yeah. too. Like, yeah, you know, he, like he's, he's very like, much. <laughs> yeah, aware. so that's pretty much it. Yeah, I'm just like, uh, I guess that is sort of my rambling reaction to like how you choose, what choices you make, what the end result is and how you define that is whether it's like about fate or not fate, depending on how you look at it. Uh, yeah, I like I like that too. I mean, there there's that line that uh, Tommy Lee Jones says he died of natural causes, and the deputy's <laughs> like, "How's that?" And he's like, "Well, natural to the, like the lifestyle that he chose, right?" Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's great. Yeah, I mean, I I think I I actually I love both of your your takes on the title. Like last night, I was kind of wondering, like, could it refer to the fact that like, you know, this world that we've been immersed in for you know two odd hours, like like there is like there there's no old men like like you know the the lifestyle that um kind of breeds early death and and violence and you know that um it's essentially a world in which everybody is is doomed to one terrible fate or another not a lot of happy endings for for many of the characters in this movie um that kind of brush up against this uh this world of 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 you know uh, drug trafficking and and bounty hunting and all the other kind of grimy stuff that we get to see. Um, also, I, I found the poem. It's sailing to Byzantium. Sailing um, to Byzantium. Mm, yep. Yes, which also includes the line, uh, "Whatever is begotten, born and dies," and kind of an existential poem. Which I think there is a definitely kind of a current of existentialism through this whole thing. Oh yes, <laughs> very 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 much. I think so similarly to in there will be blood where there's sort of echoes between the two main characters. I think you see some, some similar parallels um, between Anton and uh, Llewellyn. So I wanted to kind of talk about that. Did you notice some of those like echoes, like in uh, you know, I'll give you an example, like when they're cleaning their, their wounds um, interactions with sort of young people when they're hurt and how that those things go differently. So I wanted to talk a little bit, about how they're uh, the parallels between those two characters. Well, so I'll start like, and I'll use the example of like the interactions with the, um, you know, when both of them are are hurt, and um, they're given an article of clothing, um, and it's a very different uh, sort of interaction, right? Llewellyn when he's walking into the Mexican border, and uh, admittedly older, um, you know, like teenage I, i'm assuming they're supposed to be about 18 19 like maybe like high school kids that have gone down to mexico for a bit of drinking underage drinking you know um and uh, frivolity and uh llewellyn's quite injured and um asks for uh you know shirt to, to kind of help uh cover up his his wounds and uh Later in the film, you've got Anton Shigur, who is T-boned. Uh, that always scares the shit out of me, even when I know it's coming. It's very sudden. Um, and, uh, you know, he's got a compound fracture. And, uh, you know, he offers to uh, pay uh, the young boy for the shirt. And the boy refuses, whereas in Llewellyn's case, like, kind of demands more money for, for beer and things like that. So, um my my read on that was like i think there was like sort of like a almost like an innocent uh i don't know um or like natural like fear that maybe the kid like they didn't seem to be like terrified of shigor but i think maybe there's like a child's understanding of like this is maybe somebody who's dangerous you know a little bit um or it could just be coincidence i don't know like how do you how do you guys read that that scene i think it's very interesting to see like how like that that there's like that echo of that interaction later on and it plays out very differently with with uh Shigur. my i felt like they were oh sorry go ahead <laughs> uh my so my read is colored more by like the scenes prior to those two scenes sure mm -hmm. i think like um another like theme of the film is getting desensitized to violence 
And mm. I think that the, the, the setting for those two moments is very different. You're literally yes. on the border for Llewellyn and then you're in a really sleepy, cozy American suburb uh, for when she goes in, in that similar situation. And uh, the kids actually see the car accident happen. They're like, they are they show them in the background. So they see it happen. They know exactly what's happened to this guy and that it was just a random accident. Whereas uh, a bloodied guy approaches you on the Mexican-American border <laughs> and is asking for your shirt. <laughs> um, I think that there's an assumption because it's such a violent area that like, you know, maybe he's into some bad shit. You shouldn't be talking to him. You know, you want to make sure you're, you're getting, I guess, your, your money's worth for whatever risk you're taking on dealing with the guy. And I think that does play into a lot of that different treatment between the two is it's like, yeah, the kids are very innocent. They're living in a sheltered area. They're not going to make a negative assumption about the guy. Whereas the older kids on the border are. And I think interestingly it's enough, they do ask their... him if he was in a car wreck. Like they, they, they do, do, they do assume, <laughs> they, <laughs> which they is do a cool ass- bit of foreshadowing, but yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. They do assume. But it also feels kind of like they don't believe him. Like they kind of look at each other when he says yes after a long time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I feel like those two seeds say less about the characters and more just about, um, you know, the assumptions of the people around them. What do you think, uh, Will? Will? Oh, uh, yeah, kind of along the same lines. I mean, if I was met with somebody in the middle of the night on the border uh, who looks very bloody and unhappy and probably hurt that uh i don't know i probably wouldn't have asked for money from him in exchange if i was i'm just giving my jacket and then just leave like i think that's interesting that in like the two situations with llewellyn where it's it deals with something shady that's gone bad that he goes for the money just like the kids go for the money that he's got that he offers uh whereas the uh i should say kids the the teenagers go for the money that he offers whereas the kids at the very end are just like no man like you're hurt like here take my shirt Although, arguably, um, the kid who offers his shirt, his buddy then later says something to the effect of, hey, that money that you got, that's that's part of that's mine, right? You know, like, <laughs> so, I don't know, there's still sort of that sense that to help somebody out, you got to get something in return out of it, which I thought was, un- it's unfortunate, but it just seems to sort of be kind of that relationship that's mirrored throughout the course of the film. That nobody really helps you unless they see some sort of gain out of giving you assistance. Yeah, a lot of suspicion, like in a lot of those mm-hmm. interactions for sure. Um, all throughout. Um, did you guys notice any other echoes? Like I already kind of said one, like the cleaning of the wounds, like that you you kind of see them tending tending to themselves a very different way. Uh, I think on Mike uh May pointed out that uh Sugar's maybe a little bit more uh, <laughs> um, professional, methodical, like medical about, it. <laughs> whereas Llewellyn's very quick and dirty. But yeah, is that just a character study? Do you think, like you know, seeing like that kind of showing you how they approach a similar problem? I think it's telling that like Sugar goes straight to like an actual pharmacy and gets like real pain meds, and Llewellyn's just like, "Give me a beer." <laughs> <laughs> um I think I think it partly just reflects that like one person is trained to do this essentially and the other one is just like doing his damn best to figure it out as he goes Mm, yeah yeah absolutely um one of my little favorite details by the way from that sequence it's been a while since I read the book but something that stuck out my brain was like when Shigor is like held up in the motel is that like his character just like turns on the tv and like it's sort of his fatalistic view of the world like he does not change the channel whatever is just on the channel that was there when he turned on the tv like he just sits there for like days and like that's just the channel that's there because that's what was sort of put in front of him so it's a weird character detail but it really kind of stuck in my brain of like what an odd thing um but also kind of telling about the character the way they both check into the hotel is really interesting because it's, it's also the scene that for me like was the most suspenseful and intense is that first motel they're at when they do like the room changing exercise mm-hmm. and um, I guess it's interesting to see like how they both like treat the motel operator mm-hmm. um, and then also kind of their thought process once they get into the motel room itself and how they're navigating it. Um, I don't have much to say on that. It was just like kind of cool to see their different 
uh, response and also just like how tight and close the cat and mouse game was getting. Yeah, there's there's a lot of those like weird little echoes, like again, where you see things repeated. Like I, I enjoy that. I don't know. It's just, uh, as you said, seeing how they navigate the world um, and it, like similar circumstances in the world, but like very different outcomes sometimes or, or just ways of going about it. Um, yeah, so that double chase, you said Hitchcockian earlier, I think, Will. Uh, the double chase is a classic uh, element of Hitchcock films where you sort of have one party chasing another and then like another party chasing them. Um, that's probably one of the biggest Hitchcockian things about this film is that you've got Shigur after Llewellyn, the sheriff after kind of both of them. But, you know, um, yeah, that's uh, one of the things I, I like when I first saw it, I was geeking out because that's a hitch, uh, height of my Hitchcock obsession uh, for sure. And I was like, ah, it's a double chase. This is like brilliant. I love how they're, you know, I have again, had having read the book, like it's one thing, but see it done so well on screen. Um, just really appreciated it. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about um, Sugar, as uh, Llewellyn calls him, um, <laughs> Sugar, <laughs> uh, because I think we should spend some time on that character, um, being that he's like arguably the most recognizable uh, element to this this film. Certainly, like in marketing and like discussions when it came out, um, people could get enough of uh, Javier Bardem. So um, I, I I'm not going to guide the discussion in any particular way. So um, may just kick us off like what did you make of this character is there anything interesting that um you took away and just have at it however you like yeah so i've definitely seen javier bardem and other things but i was having trouble remembering if he was kind of modulating his voice his voice or not for this role so i went and listened to some interviews with him and he just there there's this low gravelly quality to his voice that just adds this added kind of like hollowness and creepiness to every single line he delivers. And it's, it's so good. <laughs> yes. um, and it really comes through in that scene with the gas station attendants. Um, and also just like the, the deadpan delivery. I know we'll, we'll talk about the acting later, but um, just like, the, no, you can talk about the acting now, like by all means, like it's like, you know, we'll evaluate, I mean, the way he like, delivers the these lines with like so little modulation to his voice and, and so, so quickly. And part of me wanted more background on him. That was another way this film kind of seemed unique was that we get very little background really until the end when we actually find out that Llewellyn's like a veteran. Um, like we, we get very little background on either of these guys. And I actually kind of like that for Bardem because it adds to kind of his supernatural quality. He seems in some scenes like just a, you know, person with no actual more morality and probably some sociopathy and st stuff going on. Um, and in other scenes, he seems truly like the devil incarnate. Um, and I like that that's kind of up to interpretation. The the element of chance in the coin flip is also interesting. And the fact that he has kind of a unique weapon, a go like a ghostly weapon as the sheriff kind of implies. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm obsessed with the character design for him. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, some very astute observations there. There's a lot of um, repeated like um, motifs of like kind of him being a ghost or like like discussions of him, like the word ghost is thrown around. There's this like spectral quality. Uh, to him and uh, by the way that is a very Cohen uh, brothers thing to have a villain or antagonist who seemingly kind of you know vanishes uh, or not vanishes uh, appears out of thin air and uh, you know may or may not vanish just as quickly uh, certainly this character does but um, uh, a villain with almost no backstory um, who just you know it, it almost seems supernatural in a way um, again Barton Fink comes to mind um, Raising Arizona, if you've ever seen that, like they, they, they have these characters, Fargo, as Will said, um, you know, that uh, Peter Storm air character is very much like that. You get very little back backstory. And it, it, the unsettling um, quality is, I think, um, enhanced by that, just not knowing much about their motivations or where they came from or what they're about. So do you have a favorite scene with them? Like one that was like a standout for you? I So whenever there's a character that seems like superhuman or inhuman I I do like scenes where you see a little bit of the humanity leak through and that definitely comes uh, at the very end when he's talking to Carla Jean and she kind of doesn't buy into the 
the the coin cop out that he uses, right? She she kind of puts up resistance to that. And I don't know if this is a popular interpretation, but I do kind of read the fact that he gets into a car accident later, although it's a random act of chance as him being like a little bit frazzled from that encounter. Yeah, there really only a couple of times in the film where you see somebody stand up to him or like push back a little bit. So Carla Jean is definitely the, you know, the coin don't have no say. It's yeah. just you like, it's just a great, great line. Um, and then um, similarly, but like, obviously not quite, quite as grand or dramatic a scale. I love the, um, the RV park uh, manager the woman that is just like, I can't give you no information. <laughs> and she's just staring him down, has no idea, doesn't give a shit. And uh, you could see him get kind of pissed. Like, like, I feel like his composure slips a little bit in that. Like, he's quite angry, you know. Um, but, uh, but no, I think that is a, like, that's a, a, a standout scene. So good choice. Uh, Will, my guy, um, what do you make of Mr. Sugar? And uh, <laughs> um, do you have a favorite scene? I think I really like just, uh, well, on the one hand, he's very ominous. As, and I, I think about like the eyes, like we saw with Daniel Day-Lewis, when you look at a character, you look at an actor and the character they're playing and just like the eyes and how intense they can be, like there will be blood. And so the same sort of thought process, I, I had the same sort of thought process watching this, watching Javier Bardem, because, you know, for his, along with the voice, which is definitely, um, a contributing factor to his his ominous presence it's also just like his his looks that you like you were talking about when he's staring down the lady at the at the desk the manager for the uh for the trailer park or um just sort of oh i guess when he's doing the the toying costs with the guy at the uh at the cashier stand where you know he's like <laughs> going between this frustration with trying to explain to the guy about you know his his thought process behind where he's going in his life and arguing with him about what seems like just meaningless you know conversation to the cashier uh, but I think that ultimately what was really sort of menacing the most for me was just the fact that he is so controlled and so slow when he walks anywhere he's not really in a rush to get to anything he always he knows where he's going to get and he knows how he's going to do it. And it's always very controlled and planned uh, for the most part. And so even when he's just walking up a flight of steps, when he's got his weapon of choice, whether it's the, you know, the gun with the giant silencer on the end of it, or it's the cattle prod, he is uh, just very methodical and very, uh, there's no rush. There's, it's just like, he feels like he knows how it's going to all turn out. And that sort of, I guess, uh, not necessarily determination, but just that confidence or that certainty in his mind with how that's going to go is very disturbing, I feel like, for that character. Although I can't, I honestly, the only thing that just sort of throws me off, and I think threw me off the first time I saw this movie, was his haircut. <laughs> like, it was the only thing that I thought, nah, maybe a different choice, or perhaps why he is the way that he is in some respects, but yeah. Yeah, hey, have uh... you I, yes, you might be yeah. about to say the same thing, but um, I read a quote allegedly from him about the fact that he couldn't get laid while he was filming because <laughs> <Yes. laughs> of the haircut. Yeah, he, uh, he loved it, but also was not like, you know, a fan. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. His remark about not being, he was like, I'm never going to get laid. Nope. I look like this. Um, uh, another great Coen Brothers touch there. Um, so, like, you talked about his like persistence in a lot of ways, like his sort of like well, the way this is like structured and like his pursual of uh, Llewellyn, like reminds me a lot of like, stick with me here. Like the Terminator in that like regard mm -hmm. where like, it's just like this chase that's just never going to end. It's this like killing machine, you know, not that he's an actual machine, but like that, like will find you, like that's the sole purpose like and he's very just like kind of determined and as you said confident and um the original terminator had like ha was almost like a horror film for me when i was a kid for that reason and this had like kind of echoes of that like it doesn't really matter where you go or where you hide like this guy is going to get you eventually mm -hmm. did you have a standout scene that you like that you love with him uh, trying to think about 
everything we went. You know, truthfully, it was the um, it's when you don't see him. I like when he is the silhouette mm. more than I mean, don't get me wrong, it's it's entertaining with the exchanges that he's got about the twink, uh, the excuse me, the coin toss. That's my little dyslexia there, I guess, but the <laughs> coin toss or um I guess his his discussion with Carly Jean at the end, which I enjoyed, uh, but I think it's more when I don't see him, when he was coming up the stairs and Llewellyn's in the um, at the second hotel, I guess, at that point. And it just it gets me the, the suspense that builds up where he you hear his footsteps, you hear his little detector, his transponder that's beeping because it's, you know, going after the money or the transponder that's in the, the uh, suitcase of money that Llewellyn has, or, uh, you know, just kind of thinking about what he's going to do, like he follows that same playbook about how he's going to bust the knock or the lock in the door, he's going to kick the door in, he's going to, you know, start shooting. And so that sort of build up intention, I thought that was one of the best parts of the film. And then when Llewellyn actually manages to get out of there, he still gets nicked, you know, and then he gets out of there and he's running and you see that second shot from the, the window where you just see the outline of him. Uh, that to me, I think that's probably one of my favorite scenes in the entire film was just that sort of that whole sequence. And then leading up to where Shigur actually does get injured um and how that plays out after but yeah no that was that's definitely my favorite part yeah you can feel his presence Mm -hmm. in a similar vein i also love when he's coming up behind carson wells on the staircase yes and it takes wells just a little too long to realize and he turns around and it's like oh hey (laughs) great (laughs) let's go to your room carson you know he just kind of (laughs) like He's grinning, you know, like almost good naturedly a little bit, like like hey, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can we just out of, out of curiosity with that scene? I'm glad that you brought that up. Can we just for a second talk about thoughts on why? So, like, why doesn't Carson just run? Why does he sort of does he accept his fate? Does he think that he's stuck no matter what, and he just sort of sits down and wants to argue with him because he, surely he knew. Like his odds once they went to the room together of making it out of there okay were like, like, like nothing, right? <laughs> or, For me, it's like two things. I think uh, one, like he maybe um, doesn't think it would make much difference to run. Like I think he's like this guy. If I run, like I'm probably dead. Um, either like now or later, like this guy will will come find me. Like as he's you know points out earlier, just for inconveniencing him, right? Mm-hmm. And I think too yeah. he has a small hope that maybe he can talk him out of it or buy him off like a little bit, you know, because he does try to appeal and and Sugar is like you should just accept your situation. But um, it's so weird because it's like it's exactly what he told Llewellyn was going to happen, and it's like you're still going to argue, and maybe that I don't know, maybe that reflects on the whole comment that. Uh, Shigura makes at the very end of Carly Jean it's like you all always say the same thing to me and it always turns out the same way so maybe did you have any thoughts on on that it would be interesting to hear a different read but I mean I I would agree with you I think it's just like Wells knows better than anyone else in the film what Shigura is like and I think he just knows he's gonna die I I think it's Mm. human nature to still try to barter but And I think that's why he does when they're actually sitting down. But I think at that moment, he's just like, okay, well, (laughs) (laughs) no use wasting my energy. (laughs) Oh, man. Talk about wanting more. I'm like, I wanted to hear a little bit more. Like, why did you see him in November 28th of whatever, like 1979? Like, what happened? Tell me about it. Like, (laughs) you know, that throwaway line, I'm always like. You know, give me that prequel. I want to see <laughs> see what, what Carson Wells was up to and what circumstances led to that, you know, interaction or, or sighting or whatever it was. But uh, alas. Um, he, makes a, he makes a surprise comment uh, when Llewellyn is like telling him about their encounter. And Wells is, says he's shocked that he had seen Sugar and was still alive. Mm-hmm. Um so how, how was Wells live after seeing Trigger in November? <laughs> yeah, right. Like, was it through a pair of binoculars? Like, <laughs> you know, like, um, interesting. Or maybe they worked together and that was sort of the, although Shigur doesn't really seem to play nice with others, like even on his own team. No, he killed his boss too. <laughs> yeah. 
cajole this for me please <laughs> <He's> just, <laughs> the, the, the please always kills me in that like it's very cordial yeah um, yeah i um I, I love this character i love this performance uh again like having read the novel this this could have been so hokey and just it like landed flat on its ass like uh, I, like i you really can't i can't overstate like how um like with without the right actor the right you know vocalization all that stuff like the dialogue and sort of how this character interacts with people could have just come off all the wrong ways and like i think javier barnum just like nailed it i mean and everything his posture like looking at your background like just how he's he's standing there you know um mm -hmm. i think uh just he, he commands every scene that he's in you know even if he's not talking like even some of those silent bits where he's doing a bit of snooping or stalking like you you, you just get so much from that character or from the actor rather uh, the standout scene for me is absolutely the uh the gas station clerk interaction i just I, I like there's just so many little moments like how disgusted he is like that the guy married into the gas station like he's coughing on a peanut or choking on a peanut like that he's eating like he's like you, you married into this like you know you could tell there is a uh, just disdain for the lifestyle and then the cat and mouse with the dialogue where you know he's really just everything the guy says he's trying to push a button you know, um, now is not a time. Like, what time do you close? What time do you go to bed? He's just, he's really trying to push um, the buttons and make the guy feel unsettled. Um, and of course the, the, uh, the coin toss itself and, and, you know, kind of the, the follow, like the, the dialogue after where he's like, don't you dare put that in your pocket where it just becomes another coin, which of course it is like, wow. <laughs> you know, wow. Uh, that just, it stuns me every time because it's like, wait, um so is it just a coin or is this like you know is this something more like what does he believe you know is he just pushing buttons again i don't know another aspect that i just uh remembered and i think definitely kind of set that like correct tone right from the beginning is the very first opening murder he commands to the deputy the expression on his face is like not one of like fear or that he's straining or that he's gleeful right it's just he's very like like stoic the whole time he's choking that guy and it also just kind of comes out of nowhere if because it's your first impression of him and i think that does kind of set the tone for like this guy is on another level <laughs> this is he's not he doesn't do these things for any of the normal human reasons one of the things I picked up on, you, you tell me if you think like I'm reading this correctly, but a few viewings ago, I was like, is he holding his breath alongside the guy as he's choking him? Because he has that big exhale where he turns to the side and breathes out. Uh, like I, I've kind of mm -hmm. come to read that scene is that like he's almost like holding his breath alongside the guy that he's choking, almost like he's in competition with the guy or maybe like trying to like sort of feel what this guy is feeling and then that exhale is him like as the guy's life expires sort of like i would have you know, to rewatch it that's I, very I interesting twice. yeah i the, the uh the shoe um so I, I listened to an interview with um with him and mark Marin recently which was i highly recommend very very um great interview about like his whole body of work and life he's a lovely lovely guy you would never know from watching this movie but he's a really really mm -hmm. nice guy and um they were talking about the shoe scuffs on the floor in that scene and how it's almost like yeah. a, a modern like uh abstract painting in a way and it's an indication that even if you clean up the blood there's a sort of echo of like violence that's you know taken place there and how it was like a, a a very specific choice by the coen brothers and a nice little touch um they talk about that scene um as well and how they uh, achieved it which was they essentially had a harness that would allow javier bardem to pull as hard as he could without hurting the actor that he was uh, choking and he said it's the, like one of the most exhausting days on film because he was for all intents and purposes choking somebody like over and over as hard as he could um for the entire day so, like yeah, i was exhausted after that so there's a little bit of trivia for you but wow yeah we'll circle back let me know what you guys think about that like i'd be really curious to see like 
I, I don't know. I mean, there's no way to really know without uh, asking the Coen brothers or him if that's that's what he's doing, or maybe if, maybe there's a line in the book. But that's kind of what I've come to read. Which is a it's a weird character touch that it wouldn't surprise me either way. You know, if they exhale something else, or if he is indeed like I beat you twice. Not only did I kill you, but I held my breath longer. Like, haha. <laughs> you know. <laughs> So. I, yeah, I definitely didn't catch the exhale. I did notice he, he turns when the blood starts spurting yes. out of the guy's neck. So it, he does seem to like have this aversion to getting blood on himself. Like when he also oh, like yeah. closes the shower curtain before <laughs> shooting that guy. Puts um, his feet up when yeah. uh, checks the bottom of his feet when he walks out of Carla Jean's. That's such a great little touch. Um, Interesting. Well, let's talk about some of the other um, characters of the the film or like you know we can talk about the plot at large if you want i because i I do want to give you know some nods to josh brolin and tommy lee jones and some of the other like supporting cast which i think are also quite wonderful uh in in the film so um open open that up like any other kind of standout uh scenes or our characters um just to kind of keep the discussion light and a bit generic since we're going to kind of you know zero in on on specific aspects here uh when we get to our judging so um may once again um if there's <laughs> any particular scenes or characters that uh that you want to discuss like by all means yeah i i feel like again sure there's certain characters that could have been played entirely wrong or at least in ways that were not engaging at all and i feel like tommy lee jones really made Sheriff Bell work as a character um, because I think that a lot of the my least favorite lines in the movie are actually the sheriff's lines Um, just because like I think if they weren't coming from um, you know someone that Tommy Lee Jones had shown to be like genuinely shocked and dismayed at what, what the world he's working in looks like now they would have come off as like okay boomer uh <laughs> um just kind of like less meaningful i guess is how i would would put it um uh, so i think tommy lee jones delivery there was really important and um it's interesting how you can kind of like categorize actors into like eye actors and mouth actors and kind of like what features they're really using and i feel like tommy lee jones is a great eye actor mm. And like, you could just, you could see the sorrow, I think, in his eyes at a lot of moments and just kind of like how at a loss he was. Um, and that, that really brought it home for me. Yeah, he has a genuine sense of duty, like to a member of his community. Like he goes to very um, extreme lengths to, to try to like save like this one person, you know, and it's like, I think it is like his out of sense of kind of duty or, or like genuine concern, which is kind of touching, you know. How about uh, Llewellyn? Like, what did you uh, what did you think of that character? Because he's interesting, I think, in a lot of ways. He's very interesting, and um, I think Josh Brolin does a good job of playing him as uh, completely out of his depth, but also like fa- fairly sure of himself in a certain way. Um, kind kind of kind of in the way that you'd expect for someone with his background, who like was a veteran. I think it's implied like as happens to a lot of veterans he wasn't treated very well getting back and is living a pretty poor life um which you know made this windfall all the more attractive to him and um he's he's definitely comes across as someone who's been in very uncertain scary situations and can still carry confidence about himself even when it's kind of obvious he doesn't know what he's doing so that's yeah. my read on his character. I thought he did a great job. I have an interpretation question related. Yeah. Sorry. Um, which is, do you think Llewellyn cheats with the pool girl? Uh, <laughs> I know the answer from the novel. So I can tell you uh, in the book, yes, he definitely does. Uh, I think they're a little kinder in the movie. I don't think he does in the film. I think they soften that up a little bit. He's clothed, right? Um, so unless he just finished doing some dirty business. Um, but because my, my my read was like something happens because it's like the only time you get a fade to black is mm. right after they're a little back and forth. And it's like the most yeah. intentional thing you can do. Is that yeah, I, I mean, I think you can still interpret it that way. In the, in the book, they definitely do. And I, she might be, I think, like 
they might be killed in bed or something like I, but it's explicit in the book that yes hmm. which is such an odd thing like uh, you know like the timing of that is says a lot about him you know <laughs> like that it's a lot she's... about yeah no, i was no, just gonna say it's a lot about him but it also for me ties into kind of like whether you see Chigur as just like a human psychopath or an actual force of nature like the, the fact that Llewellyn survives up to the point where he, you know, quote unquote, sins, basically, and then gets taken out. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, um, I like to view, I don't know, I, I've always kind of viewed that character as the latter. You, like, to me, he is a force of nature. He is like this, like, grim reaper, you know, kind of figure, yeah. but that's the romantic in me, you know, with a, a capital R. Um <laughs> All right, so before we move to judgment mode, uh, May has her handy board uh, with a new bit of budget-related uh, trivia, trickery. I'm all about um, the numbers, Chris. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That's that's a uh, classic English major right there, being all about the numbers, right? <laughs> Fun fact, I'm actually an English and STEM ma- major. So oh, are well, you? Double okay. trouble. Fair play. Double trouble. I did not know that. I learned something new about you. So I mean, it was biology, not math but <laughs> okay well there you go fucking cheater all right <laughs> <laughs> okay no country for old men uh true false over under uh do you think it had a budget of 25 million uh this would have been in 2007 dollars there will be blood was like similar right like we i know it was just a week ago that we talked about that but it was somewhere <laughs> around there so yeah. I think it was like 30 or something, right? Um, damn, over or under. I am going to say just over. I think it's over, but not by much. Or you it's can say that is the number. Yeah. Uh, see, are you trying to like... Hey. <laughs> <laughs> or you can say uh, that there was no number. <laughs> <laughs> it's an imaginary number, $25 million. <laughs> um, I don't know how math works. Fine, I'll say it's spot on since you nudged me that way. And then I could blame you if I get it wrong. <laughs> okay, uh, well. I'm going to have to say it's spot on unless my Googling uh, before the show, because I will admit, uh, I knew going into this, this was going to be the question and uh, fool me three times. Could be four. I mean, we never know, but I'm going to go with Google and I'm going to say that it is that number exactly, 25 million. So yes, yes, it is. It is 25 million. Occasionally I do have to put the real number up because I can't have you guys always guessing false. Um, (laughs) But yeah, that's another place where uh, these two films are very similar because I'll fact check myself. But I think that was pretty much exactly what uh, the budget for There Will Be Blood was as well. So we can yeah, talk about the parallels right between there. these two films coming out at the same time from the same companies for the same shot amount the same of money, location. shot in the same location, yes, interrupted filming of each is, other. It is also 25 million. <laughs> wow. So same yeah. budget. Whoever was signing off on the checks there was like, this is the... Uh, what the budget should be for like a, a big budget indie movie is i don't know there's i'm sure a better term than that but that's kind of what these are right like they're not really indie movies but they're geared towards a specific kind of audience and uh very much like oscar bait so yeah. well thank you for sharing may um it is uh it's only fitting that there will be blood and no country have the same exact budget uh given all the <laughs> other similarities between them uh so that brings us to judgment time um let me ask you do you want to know uh in the categories that we've picked out which to remind our audience are uh, screenplay or writing directing cinematography acting and then we're going to do like our overall like package like best picture kind of category do you want to know like which one won in each of the categories before we judge or do you want to do that as we go I may have looked most of these up. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I certainly did. I put it, uh, I made a little list. Well, as the odd man out, I will go with afterwards if you want to do it that way. Or as as we go? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. All right. That sounds good. So we can do this one of two ways. Uh, We can go one at a time or we can go by category and and cast our votes and I'll I'll keep tally the scores. I think category. By category, that's a little more mm-hmm. exciting, right? It creates more suspense. All right. <laughs> um, so, 
In debate, yes. <laughs> All right. So let's let's start with um, with screenplay. So both of these are adapted works. There will be blood from uh, Upton Sinclair's Oil with an exclamation, I think, and then No Country for Old Men, Cormac McCarthy. Uh, so I'm gonna go from May to Will to me, and we're gonna just do that order. Um, so May, uh, give us your pick for best screenplay or writing, and uh, your reason why. All right. So both are both are action heavy films here. Uh, there will be blood. I think has a lot less dialogue going on, a lot more just long shots of oil rigs and such. But I do think that the dialogue really matters. Like every single word has like a lot of weight in there will be blood. Um, and we talked a lot about how in no country, a lot of the lines would have come off a bit differently if they had different actors uh, speaking them. And I think like independent of the film, the screenplay for No Country just was not quite as strong as There Will Be Blood. Um, I also found some of the uh, dialogue specifically from the sheriff to be just, um, I don't know, a little bit like it was gesturing at a lot of different ideas without really kind of like honing in on anything. Whereas the dialogue in there will be blood felt very raw and authentic and communicated a lot in very few words, which is what I tend to value in a screenplay. So there will be blood for me. Thanks. All right. Point for there will be blood in the writing category. <laughs> How about you, Will? <laughs> so I'm actually going to go the other way. Um, I would vote for No Country for Old Men for the screenplay, mostly because of, I guess, some of the aspects that we touched on before, the dark humor, the banter back and forth between the characters. And I think uh, something that you had brought up to, uh, I think, well, sort of on this discussion, but also when we were doing our um, our screening together was that it's very, it, there's a lot of fidelity to the book and to the, the writing style, uh, to McCarthy's um, points and just the the language the di as it's written in the book because I remember like it was very much written as it was supposed to sound for the characters so to see that actually taken and then uh, represented here and as well as it was with the character with the actors that they got to portray those characters um, I think overall for me that was why I'd have to go with that screenplay instead awesome so I'm also going to award this point to uh, No Country for Old Men, not because of the dialogue in particular. I think to me, they're a very even footing with that. And I might even give the edge to uh, There Will Be Blood, um, but rather how the film unfolds, right? So the handling of the material, the pacing, um, and just really putting into, um, you know, I don't know, like a uh, visual representation of what's on the page. Like, I think it's one of the greatest adaptations like of a, a novel ever, uh, not only being faithful, but really bringing something to life that uh, is pretty challenging. If you read the source material, um, it was like, I was reading the book again when I, when I saw the, the film, um, just the weight of it all, everything. So that is my point and why. Let's go next to uh, cinematography is the next category I'm going to pick. Uh, so very difficult. Both of these movies are gorgeous and, uh, I have a soft spot. I will say for Roger Deakins. So, um, this was a hard choice for me. Roger Deakins was the, uh, the DP on, um, no country for old men, but he also did stuff like Blade Runner 2049 and just has an immaculate record of great cinematography. So may give us your pick and why. So this one was not even close for me um as much as i love a lot of the elements of there will be blood um a lot of what's going on in the scene is i think less camera work and more um all of the other elements that kind of go into the mise-en-scene and um there's just like less going on creatively i think with the camera work than and that you see with no country for old men and i just as i was watching no country for old men got chills from some of the framing that was used. Uh, specifically, we talked about the scene uh, where the other agent is walking up the stairs and Jigger is coming up behind him. And just the use of the camera to really kind of amplify Jigger's ghost-like qualities um, was great. 
So I'm going to have to give cinematography to No Country for Old Men. Excellent. Thank you. Will, how about you? <laughs> you know, it was this was hard for me because originally I was thinking there will be blood um, just because of the beautiful establishing shots and feeling like I was really in that that time frame with at least in in the realm of the story that they wanted to tell. Um, but, you know, the more that we talked about especially like the the elements of the suspense building up to feeling like Shigur is always over your shoulder or in the reflection somewhere or that haunting silhouette. I, I have to go with No Country for Old Men, similar reasons. Um, just visually beautiful and bleak and just some of the stylistic element, even like you were talking about with, you know, looking down at the floor and the scuff marks on the, the tile. So many or, feet. I know so many feet, so many bloody feet. Lots yeah, we know of who Tarantino feet. would pick for this one. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's like all over it, man. It's got violence and it's got feet combined. Like that scene where Llewellyn's just what was it, Chris, that you call that tough acting to acting with like spraying oh, on his feet. Yeah, just on open sores, like <laughs> well, on yeah. his feet. Oh. When he's swapping out his socks and his boots in the in that one clothing store, it was yeah, that was solid. Whereas Sugar is much more I guess back to the you know the interplay between the comparison between the two. But yeah, ultimately cinematography i'd have to say no country it's gonna be a clean sweep um i had a hard but a very hard time with this because like I, I think um there will be blood does so much especially in the first 20 minutes where there's no dialogue to really immerse you and and sort of make you feel like you're down in the mine or out on the, the you know the plains and got some of those shots like of the like the burning oil dairy there's so many iconic shots um but ultimately I, I mean i think no country for old men is a master class in just uh i don't know um showcasing uh suspense and violence in interesting ways and you have so many just striking um moments uh, that are owed a lot to how the the you know the scenes are framed um whether it be the distance or as you, you pointed out reflections just there's a lot of little odd very specific choices that uh help kind of drive the point home um even just like like i think like in the opening uh sequence like having shigor like hop out of his little manacles like in the background like just like how there's that deep focus and you just like you see that like that's a specific choice right you could have easily um had him off camera and then just surprise the audience like and you know have him uh, come up behind or something but like i just yeah i think uh it edges it edges it out it's not as clear cut for me but i do think it's the it's the stronger bit of cinematography so yeah all right uh so let's go to acting now i i want to want to throw some spice in there hopefully this is a tough <laughs> tough choice for you guys because i know it was for me like so we're not going to pick specific actors just uh we're gonna i'm going to treat this as an ensemble or oh, wow. you can evaluate this. <laughs> yeah. yeah you can evaluate nice. this on whatever merits you want it's not something as simple as like daniel day lewis versus Javier Bardem just because like a they were like technically supporting and, and lead actors in the film but I think both of these have an interesting ensemble of uh, of characters but you, you can really approach this however you like this is a hard one this is probably the one where I was most tempted just to be like they're both great <laughs> <laughs> they are it's not a wrong statement I mean uh, because I do feel like it is very tempting to just reduce it to Daniel Day-Lewis versus Javier Bardem because they really carried both films which is not a dig at any of the other actors it's just 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 phenomenal precedent setting performances from both of them right um i particularly like what we kind of talked about with like the eyes and the the intensity that both men have it's a very different kind of intensity it's kind of a uh, like uh a drunken hunger in the case of Daniel Day Lewis, whereas it's a much more sinister kind of methodical passion in the eyes of Shigur, but it's still just a lot there. Um, and they both seem very dedicated to their roles. Um, I think I will have to give it to There Will Be Blood, um, in part just because I think that the other actors did a bit better, um, particularly like the. Um, Eli, uh, I'm sorry, I 
Didn't Paul pull Dana? the cast list. No, Thank no, you, it's Paul okay. Dana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All it's good. It happens to the best of us. No worries. <laughs> um, anyway, so Paul Dano uh, just knocked that role out of the park, especially all the sermons that he had to do. And like, that's, again, another scene that could have come off as very funny and at times did come off as funny, but in, I think, the intended way. Um, and I just, I, I loved everyone in There Will Be Blood. Fantastic performances. Um, that's my vote. <laughs> awesome. Will, how about you? I'd have to go with There Will Be Blood also. But it's, for me, I was looking at it from just an individual actor. And for me, Daniel Day-Lewis is like, he knocks it out of the park. I mean, I look at that guy and he becomes the character that he plays. And yeah, so that's that's my short and sweet answer. Yeah, another clean sweep here. I think that uh, it's the strongest pairing, you know, if you were to like compare mm-hmm. and contrast, like not that Josh Rowland didn't do a great job, he did, but like I think it, it is a great one two punch with Paul Dano and, and Daniel Day Lewis. And um, just uh, you get more interplay between the characters too, which I think kind of helps make the case where you have two phenomenal actors that are really kind of at odds and, and bouncing off each other for a lot of the, the movie and for somebody to be able to stand up um, next to Daniel Day Lewis and that performance and to, to do as well as Paul Dano did is quite impressive. Um, I don't know if this is true, but uh, I had read somewhere that he used to chase him around the crafts table, like in character, uh, Daniel Day Lewis and Paul Dano, um, <laughs> harassing him and get, like kind of yelling at him and stuff like oh he's a method actor. I don't know if that's true or not. So like, please don't take that as, uh, as truth. I just read that somewhere. Um, also, is it, is it Paul Dano? Cause I've been calling him Paul Dano. I don't <laughs> like know. Danish. Yeah. I, it, we've, we've established we're not, we're far from perfect on the podcast. Yeah. It very well could be Dano or Dano. I'm not sure. So that's another clean sweep though. So, uh, there will be blood takes it in the acting category. Um, so let's go next to director. So we have two very, um, different uh well there's really a, a pair of directors in the coen brothers and then we have uh you know the uh pt anderson um as the director of there will be blood um very unique stamps very different styles for the two of them but powerhouses in their own right so in the directing category may who gets the point this is another tough one because like you said <laughs> they both have very different uh sort of strategies for storytelling right um mm-hmm. i mean that i'm gonna have to go with the easy pick which is no country for old men just because like it's such a distinctly coen brothers film and um i i, I just think that again because you're working with uh you know unique source material and there's that challenge of meshing their style with the source material they just pulled it off in an incredible way so will how about you you know, and not to sound like I'm copying, but those that's I can't honestly sum up better the reasons for why I also chose the Coen brothers. I mean, it's spot on. I would have to agree with all those points. Thank you. It's awesome. It's also my <laughs> reasoning as well. Uh, I, I, I think like it is nothing short of a miracle that you could take source material that is so distinct and like, again, so very Cormac McCarthy and uh, to put your unique stamp on, to make it still feel like a Coen Brothers movie. So, yep, that's exactly the reason I was going to cite. And, um, yep. And I can y'all also, go like, first next time. <laughs> no, and, and they made specific choices, right? So if I wanted to be like specific, like, or a little more specific about it, like they made such like intentional choices to, to flesh out that world. There's a lot of things that are sort of, you know, gaps and that's not a dig at McCarthy's writing, but there are intentional gaps that are just kind of left up to the reader's imagination. And as a filmmaker, you have to kind of bring that into focus and, and make a choice. Right. Whereas like when you're writing a novel, you can leave a little bit more up to interpretation, right. Cause you're allowing people's minds to fill in blanks and things like that. So I think, um, you know, they, they made the right choices. We'll put it that way. And I think like, that's, that's, uh, a testament to, to how great they are as filmmakers. So, Okay, that brings us to our best picture category, which I'm going to allow some leeway, but like in my mind, this is like, what is the better complete package, right? Like, where, like what, which of these two movies like has, I don't know, for you the most staying power or do you think like 
all the parts work together better however you want to define that but you had to give best picture or we could just like stop it here if you want because the uh, <laughs> the contest is pretty clearly won so we could just give the award <laughs> to the film that is uh no it's not i feel like okay it's be the contrarian here uh nice. perfect i love not it over yet, Chris. <laughs> a little bit of spice on not a Sunday. Over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's do it okay so specifically as a writer i i write books in my free time uh listeners anyway specifically as a writer um i know how difficult it is to stay very tightly on task for the story you're trying to tell in a longer work, whether it's a novel or a film. And I think it's especially difficult in the medium of a thriller because you have to keep that tension going and building uh, in order to keep kind of your reader's interest, particularly with people who are not very likable, right? Mm -hmm. Which would describe most of the men in these films. <laughs> um, and my main gripe with No Country for Old Men is the fact that while it's a very intentional choice, I acknowledge this, there is um, a complete break to the tension about 30 minutes before the end of the film, right? When, when Moss dies. Uh, and you, you do have some moments uh, like when Jigar goes and confronts his wife, um, where you, you, you know, you're feeling that anxiety and tension again, but it's more of like kind of an aftershock of like the, the what I would say was the main film. Um, and I think that it, while beautiful, is not quite as tight of a narrative as There Will Be Blood. And I just love how well the tension was kept in There Will Be Blood. And the fact that it's kind of self-aware of that with the last line literally being, I'm finished right after the murder is complete, <laughs> right? Like I, that, that just blew me away. Um, and I think that it's also a movie where I would not have, if, if you told me it was too long, I had to cut a scene. There was not a single scene and there will be blood. I would have felt comfortable cutting. It felt like everything was extremely necessary. Same thing with the dialogue. Whereas in No Country for Old Men, there were a lot of scenes where I was like, I'm not getting much from this. It's a beautiful scene. But again, it seems to be kind of just um, dressing on what is already an interesting story that I wish we could focus on more. Hmm. So I'm going to give it to There Will Be Blood, and I acknowledge that I'm going to be the outlier. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, actually, I'm glad that you're a contrarian. Uh, Will, I don't mean to jump over you, but um, I actually oh, think you. there will there will be blood. <laughs> is I think it is the better film. Like if you were to ask me, like pound for pound, what's the better movie? Like I would I would pick this like without hesitation. Um, not to say that like uh, I consider No Country for Old Men to be uh, chump change by any by any stretch, but like I I do prefer There Will Be Blood to No Country. Yeah, for no, Old they're Men. both great. I'm nitpicking here basically because that's the only way to decide between the two <laughs> yes no yeah you do i mean at the end of the day you do have to kind of nitpick but i i'm very confident in that like i i, I just i tend to enjoy there will be blood um a bit more and like it, it is a movie i think is better right like i don't know like how else to to put it but like that's just my read like if i had to rank them Will's leaving <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's getting in the car with sugar he's gonna let the chips fall with right. i'm done so no, well no I pressure um I'll, I'll break down the points in a second but like what's your what's your vote <laughs> so you know it's funny that's um I think I threw in an extra category when I was looking at this stuff. So I had a, an item for soundtrack, uh, not to put a wrinkle in anything as well. Um, but just to, as a random aside, as I'm prone to do with my thoughts, um, I would have to say there will be blood had a better soundtrack. That yes. was, that was definitely down with the suspense and just sort of the, with all the string instruments, just building that very ominous tension throughout the entire film up until like, as May pointed out, the very end when you know we we see plenty of blood and <laughs> and Daniel Plainview is like I'm finished, and then the the music just changes so dramatically after that yeah. for the credits. It, the um, they do it's the same theme as like when they're doing the christening of the uh, the Derek. I don't know if you picked mm. up on that, but it's like it's very jovial. 
<laughs> yeah. Like, hey, oh, oh, yeah, it wasn't that this pleasant. Yeah. Good, <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Sorry. So, yeah. Continue. Oh no, please don't apologize. No, uh, that's this is the best part. Uh, so yeah. So I would say that there is that to keep in mind. And also kind of uh, off of many of the points that you both already raised, I would have to go with there will be blood as best picture as well. Uh, just visually stunning and the acting and just feeling more immersed in that um, in that story, very tightly done. I mean, we have talked a little bit before in the last, or I feel like we talked in the last episode about some of the, uh, I guess, deleted scenes that there's some of the items that may not have actually made the final cut for There Will Be Blood. Um, but I think it, on the same point, disagreeing, it was very, very tightly done, very well executed. And overall, I just, that was, yeah, I was much more enthusiastic. If we're, and again, nitpicking, definitely agree because it is so close for both. Um, but I think in the end, there will be blood would have been my choice as well for best picture. Awesome. Yeah, I, I don't know. To me, it's like the closest I've ever felt to like, especially like a modern film feeling like, and I know this is going to make kind of not sense, but like feeling like a, a great piece of American literature. Like it's the, it's the closest I've ever felt to it, having that old school Faulkner. Like that's, I love that era of American literature and this just feels so fucking literary. Um, despite the fact that it's got very little to do with its source material. And I just, I love it. It feels like a great modern American masterpiece to me. Yeah. And not to say that no country for old men isn't good. Um, but I think like, that's the different, like modern, uh, like no country for old men is like a, a great modern thriller. Like it's as good as a thriller mm -hmm. gets. Whereas like there will be blood to me. is just like slightly elevated. I think there's just something just a bit more yeah. substantial there, but. Awesome. And very, so, very relevant too. like, especially with what they, what they're dealing with in terms of like the, you know, the religion and, you know, the big business. And so, yeah, absolutely. Familial things. Yeah. There's just, there's a yeah. lot going on there. Uh, so that no country for old men is technically our winner, but just by one point. So if we were to break down individual points and not by category, no Country for Old Men had a total of eight, and There Will Be Blood had a total of seven. Uh, no Country also won the most amount of categories from us. So screenplay, director, cinematography, where There Will Be Blood took best picture and acting and clean sweeps in those categories. So technically, our first Sethi will go to No Country <laughs> for Old Men. So well done. I know that it's the most prestigious award that uh, this film will ever receive <laughs> in its lifetime. Uh, Academy, get out of here. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, well done. Um, that was, uh, was, was a lot of fun uh, to, to debate those two uh, 2007 masterpieces. All right. Awesome. Oh, uh, I, I guess I said I was going to say which ones won at the Academy Awards, and I didn't. So here is yes, our quick please. breakdown of that. So in uh, the screenplay category, No Country for Old Men won Best Adapted Over There Will Be Blood. Best Director also went to No Country for Old Men to the Coen Brothers. Uh, cinematography was There Will Be Blood. And of course, as I said, the acting uh, categories were technically different. So Best Lead Actor went to Daniel Day-Lewis, Best Supporting to Javier Bardem. They did not have to go up against each other. Best Picture went to No Country for Old Men as well at the Oscars that year. So um, it looks like we agreed with actually, so we disagreed on best picture. We agreed on screenplay. We uh, agreed on director and we disagreed on cinematography with the Academy. So as I said, oh. get out of here, Academy. This is the real, like just <laughs> throw us on the board, give us ultimate uh, weight in our voting, you know, uh, wait, like 10 votes to everyone else's one. Sounds about right. <laughs> All right. Nice. So, uh, we will not have time for a game because we are at time, but we do get to draw our next card. So, oh, yeah. All right. So without further ado, shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Let's see what our next film is. Oh, no. I just I flung the cards off of uh, the, <laughs> the, the board, apparently. Uh, amazing. I didn't know that was possible. <laughs> Well, because it's like, there's like, moment, there's ragdoll physics and stuff. 
in this. Yes. Oh, oh no! But you can like you can overturn the entire board like if you want in this game. All right, so here we go. Let's draw our next card. Ooh, it is a who is the real villain, Ooh. and the film is going to be the Prestige. It is a Chris pick, and it is the Prestige. So that's, that's going to be a fun discussion. Uh, we were just talking about Chris Nolan films, and I think the Prestige <laughs> came up. I promise we don't do this on purpose. You can see me shuffle on our uh, a podcast live, so um, there's no funny business. I promise. Now I got to make sure there's no. We'll cuts. talk about a film I've actually already seen like two or three times. So I'm excited. Awesome. This is only going to be my second watch of this, and I really liked it the first time. As I, as I said before. Uh, Inception turned me off and no one for for a little while and then uh, because of the inside jokes on uh, the IGN UK podcast um, everybody they interview like I'm talking famous directors they're like have you seen the prestige did you like it like that's their inside joke uh, just because it throws people you know on a press junket like in 2022 <laughs> they're like have you seen the prestige and do you <laughs> like it um, so that's I was like all right I gotta finally watch this fucking movie see what all the fuss is about it's quite good all right. Well, that brings us to time. Uh, hope you all enjoyed our two-part discussion. We'll probably continue to split these versus mode up, or if we do a director drill down just to, you know, keep the episodes at a, a, a manageable length and to give everyone time to watch multiple films, please follow us on social media. You can find us at ScreenQuest Pod on Twitter. We do Friday film polls where you can uh, decide things like what is the better movie, No Country for Old Men or There Will Be Blood. You can have a voice as well until next time we love you bye 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 guys <laughs>